Well, good morning. This is uh, May the 24th version of Frickin' Frack Teach Sunday School. And since this week's lesson in the uh, International Sunday School book suggested doing another lesson on justice or righteousness and then another righteousness lesson again next week, Chuck and I decided maybe it might be a little better if we went with something more generic this week and just focused on that. So we're going to do a lesson on hope this week, and we hope that you'll like it. Uh, I'm going to start this week, since we don't have uh, a video by Ron Penny, I'm just going to start giving you a little bit of background on how the word hope is used in the Old Testament. In Hebrew, words don't have single meanings. They have ranges of meanings. So when you're looking at a word like hope, hope can mean to trust, to wait, to abide in, to expect. Or it can mean all of those things all at the same time. And that's pretty much the way hope is used in the Old Testament. It sort of represents all of those most of the time, at least when you're talking about our relationship with God and our hope in Him. Uh, to non-believers, hope is just a waste of time. It's a raising of expectations that are doomed to be torn asunder. For instance, in the movie The Shawshank Redemption, there are three key scenes that deal with the subject of hope. And in the first clip that I'm going to show you, the old prison librarian, Brooks, has been sent out into the world now institutionalized, with no support, nothing to orient himself, and nothing to lean on for guidance or strength. Needless to say, uh, Brooks End is not a happy when he commits suicide in his little hotel room. And when the word gets back to his former friends, as it happens, Andy Dufresne is just getting out of two weeks in solitary confinement. And as they're sitting at the lunch table, they discuss the subject of hope. Here it is. Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a mean harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Yeah, forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a, there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. Hope. Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. Like Brooks did. Hope is the proper response to the promises of God. Abraham serves as a prime example here. Even though he was very old, he had confidence that God would fulfill his promises. God had told him he would lead him to the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. And Abraham never saw the promised land, never entered into it. But he trusted God that one of these days God would fulfill his promises to his children or his children's children. And he had promised him that he would not just be a father, he would be the father of many nations. So here he is at 99, and his wife is about 90, and God has still been slow in fulfilling his promises. But still, Abraham trusts, and Abraham hopes. So, God, as it happens, comes and fulfills his promises, and Abraham is the joyful father of many nations because he has trusted that God was going to do what God had promised to do. And that's a lesson for us. Even when it sounds like it might be impossible, perhaps, especially when it sounds like it might be impossible, we need to keep believing. 
Our Christian hope isn't just a better attitude than what other people have. It's our trust that God's future has intruded into the present. God's future is changing our life right now. Jesus is going to return in the future. But God's future is showing up before we expected it. Ours is now, therefore, a living hope. Because in Jesus' birth and life, his death and his resurrection, God has taken up our lost cause and made it his own. There's a wonderful writer, uh, Arthur Gordon by name, who wrote a book entitled A Touch of Wonder in which he tells about a man who had been a skydiver until the day came when on his 19th jump, his parachute failed to fully open and his emergency chute wrapped partially around his main chute and he slammed into a dry lake bed at 60 miles an hour. Doctors thought that this broken remnant of a man would never leave his hospital bed and they told him so and he sank into a black despair. But in the hospital, he had frequent visits from another patient, a man whose spinal cord had been severed in an automobile accident. This man would never walk, would never, in fact, move a finger again. But he was always cheerful. I certainly don't recommend my situation to anyone, he would say. And yet, I can read, I can listen to music, I can talk to my people. And yet, writes Arthur Gordon, those two words, and yet, shift the focus from what has been lost to what remains and to what may still be gained. They gave such hope and determination to the skydiver that he came through his ordeal and today walks without even so much as a limp. In times of social change, and especially in times of war, people seek security. Some people who crave certainty leap for a faith that gives them all the answers. So they chatter away saying, oh, everything's going to be all right. Many other people turn away from an uncertain future toward the past with a fit of nostalgia. Weren't things better in the good old days? Well, yeah. If you like carrying water a mile and spending all of Monday bent over a tub with a washboard, and yes, at the turn of the century, uh, life was better if, contrary to our today's working 40 hours a week and living until 80, you'd rather work 80 hours a week and live until you die at 40. Gosh, those really were the good old days, weren't they? Well, when I meet old friends in ministry today, I always want to ask, what's new in your faith? What's God doing in your life right now? Christian hope isn't about keeping the world the way it is, or the way we thought it was or should have been, but making it better. And Jesus does it by making us better. That's what Jesus strains toward and hopes for, our changing for the better. We won't get everything done here, and we won't make life perfect. But if we hope, then we'll try. Hope is active and it makes plans. Hope buys green bananas. Now this world isn't always beautiful or a hopeful place. We'd be liars if we said it was, either in the past or in the present. The New Testament proclaims the eternal good news that God has come here in the past and that God is helping us in the present. God awaits us in the future. Listen to this from King David, who wrote these two verses from his Psalms. From Psalm 130, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. And from Psalm 33, But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. And this from Isaiah 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. 
when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. And this is one of my favorites. It's from Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my right <clears throat> is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then one of the greatest symbols of hope in all of the Old Testament deals with the prophet Jeremiah. As the people of Judah are being led into Babylon in captivity, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah and tells him to buy a field. It's the field of one of his cousins, and before he can sell it on the open market, this cousin needs to bring it to some other family member to see if they will redeem it, pay him some money, and then the land becomes theirs. We'll begin at 32 verse 6. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field in Anathoth. Because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. Then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. Since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew that this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel. And I weighed out for him seventeen shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed and had it witnessed, and weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Neriah, the son of Messiah in the presence of my cousin Hanamel and of the witnesses who had signed the deed and all of the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. In their presence I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both the sealed and the unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Understand the Babylonians are taking all of the Jews out of Judah and into Babylon, into slavery. There's absolutely no guarantee that they're going to be returning. Probably no one in Jeremiah's uh, generation will be returning. But his faith in God is sufficient that he will pay his cousin 17 shekels of silver. Silver that he might well need in captivity to survive or to pay off a guard or whatever he needs to do to keep himself and his family safe. But he buys the land and he puts the deeds in a clay jar so that it will be preserved for a long time, so that when the day comes that they do return, that deed will be found and they will be remembered of God's promise that the houses, the fields, and the vineyards would again be bought in this land. Now, I'm not a connoisseur of great art, but from time to time I do see a painting that speaks a clear, strong message. Some time ago, I saw a picture of an old, burned-out mountain shack. 
and all that remained was the chimney, the charred debris of what had been that family's sole possession. In front of this destroyed home stood an elderly man, dressed only in his underclothes with a small boy clutching a pair of patched overalls. It was evident that the child was crying. Beneath the picture were the words which the artist felt the old man was speaking to the boy. There were simple words, yet they presented a profound theology and a philosophy of life. And those words were these. Hush, child. God ain't dead. Now, at the end of the Shawshank movie, Andy has escaped and his old friend Red has been paroled. And after un undergoing his own struggles on the outside, he goes to a spot in a field that Andy had told him about and where Andy had said he would leave a message for him. And Red finds the package, opens it up, and reads the letter. And he finds out that Andy is waiting for him, that his heart and mind are suddenly changed within him. And he dares, for the first time in his life, to hope against hope that his dreams can come true. And so we'll watch this clip. Dear Red, if you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? Say what to nail. I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you and the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you and finds you well. Your friend, Andy. Now finally free of all that has held him back, Red voices his dream and looks forward to the reunion with his friend. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's goddamn right. For the second time in my life, I'm guilty of committing a crime. Parole violation. Of course, I doubt they'll toss up any roadblocks for that. Not for an old crook like me. Fort Hancock, Texas, please. I find I'm so excited I can barely sit still or hold a thought in my head. I think it's the excitement only a free man can feel. A free man at the start of a long journey whose conclusion is uncertain. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. May the God of hope fill you with all hope and cause you to live within the fullness of his grace as we journey to the paradise that awaits us and the friend who waits to greet us. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mike took the Old Testament. I took the New. Uh, in the process of getting ready for today's lesson, I came across a... Uh, 
story, and it was a true story, uh, about a for sale ad that appeared in the classified section of the Roanoke, Illinois Review. And the classified ad read, Hope Chest, brand new, half price, long story. I'd like to know the story behind that one, wouldn't you? Uh, this morning the theme of our lesson is on hope. Sometimes I think our world needs right now is hope. This morning's lesson reminds us that we live between times, between the beginning and between the end, between the first coming of Christ and the second coming. The passage I selected uh, for today from the New Testament deals with hope, and it's taken from Romans 5, verses 2 through 5, which read as follows. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. William Barclay, in his passage uh, on today's lesson, uh, talks about that, and he says, that, and this is in his daily study guide, in his commentary, he writes at one of Paul's great lyrical passages in which he almost sings the intimate joy of his confidence in God. Trusting faith has done what the labor to produce the works of the law could never do. It has given a man peace with God. Before Jesus came, no man could ever be really close to God. Some have seen him as the complete stranger, the utterly untouchable. In one of H.G. Wells' books, there's the story of a man of affairs whose mind was so tensed and strained that he was in serious danger of a complete nervous and mental breakdown. His doctor told him, the only thing that could save him was to find peace, that fellowship that only God can give. What? he said. To think that up there, having fellowship with me, I would just as soon think of cooling my throat with a Milky Way or shaking hands with the stars. God to him was the completely unfindable. Fortitude, Paul says, produces character. The word he chose for character is donkimi, the Greek word. And donkimi has a number of definitions that can be used, but generally it's spoke of as used when metal is purified, which has been passed through the fire so that everything base or worthless has been purged out of it. It's used of coinage as we use it, the word sterling. When affliction is met with fortitude, out of the battle a man emerges stronger, purer, better, and nearer God. Character, Paul goes on, produces hope. Two men can meet the same situation. It can drive one of them to despair, and it can spur the other to triumphant action. To one, it can be the end of hope. To the other, it can be a challenge to greatness. The different corresponds to the difference between the men. If a man has let himself become weak and fat, flabby, if he has allowed circumstances to beat him, if he has allowed himself to whine and grovel under affliction, he has made himself such that when the challenge of the crisis comes, he cannot do other than to despair. If on the other hand, a man has insisted on meeting life with head up, 
If he has always faced and by facing conquered things, then when the challenge comes, he meets it with eyes aflame with hope. The character which has endured the test always emerges in hope. Then Paul makes one last great statement in this verse. The Christian hope never proves an illusion, for it is founded on the love of God. When a man's hope is in God, it cannot turn to dust and ashes. When a man's hope is in God's, it cannot be disappointed. When a man's hope is in the love of God, it can never be an illusion. For God loves us with an everlasting love backed by an everlasting power. How should we handle the things, the events, which crush our faith and hope? It's simple. Love God. Love your neighbor. Pray every day. Worship at least weekly. Give both of yourself and of your income. Read your instruction manual, the Bible. Help others. It really can't get much simpler than that. When we do all of these things, when we practice our faith and put it into action every day, then we'll be able to not only see the signs, but read them as well. And we will stay ready. In preparing for today's lesson, I, I came across uh, a little story is that one Sunday morning after church, a mother was talking to her young daughter. She told her daughter that according to the Bible, Jesus would return to earth someday. When is he coming back? The daughter asked. I don't know, replied the mother. Well, can't you look it up on the internet? The little girl asked. And in that truth lies hope. Because the underlying message of this passage is one of hope, it all boils down to basically three things. One, Jesus is coming back. Two, God's in charge of the timetable. And three, get ready. You see, there's a universal need for hope. If you can look at the sunset and smile, then you still have hope. If you can find beauty in the colors of a small flower, if you can find pleasure in the movement of a butterfly, if the smile of a child can still warm your heart, then you still have hope. If you can see the good in other people, if the rain breaking on a rooftop can still lull you to sleep, if the sign of a rainbow still makes you stop and stare in wonder, if the soft fur of a favored pet still feels pleasant under your fingertips, then you still have hope. If you meet new people with a trace of excitement and optimism, if you give people the benefit of the doubt, if you still offer your hand in friendship to others that have touched your life, then you still have hope. If receiving an unexpected card or letter still brings a pleasant surprise, if the suffering of others still fills you with pain and frustration, if you refuse to let a friendship die, or if you accept that it must end, then you still have hope. If you can look forward to a time or place of quiet and reflection, if you still buy the ornaments and put up the Christmas tree or cook the Christmas turkey, if you still watch love stories or want the endings to be happy, then you still have hope. If you can look to the past and smile, if when faced with the bad, when told everything is futile, 
you can still up, look up and end the conversation with the phrase, yeah, but. If you can do that, you still have hope. Hope is such a marvelous thing. It sustains us when nothing else can. It gives us a reason to continue and a courage to move on when we tell ourselves we'd rather give in. Hope puts a smile on our face when the heart cannot manage. Hope puts our feet on the path when our eyes cannot see. Hope moves us to act when our souls are confused of the direction. Hope is a wonderful thing, something to be cherished and nurtured, and something that will refresh us in return. It can be found in each of us, and it can bring light into the darkest places. Never, never lose hope. Hope is based on our faith in God. There is no other foundation for hope in this world. Economic systems crumble. Governments rise and fall. Only God, only God's truth, marches on through the ages. God is a loving God who watches over His children. Where God is, Hope never dies. Hope. It's one of the most beautiful words in the English language. It evokes thoughts of sunrise that push back all kinds of darkness. It suggests birth and healing and promise and possibility. Hope makes us able to keep on going. Or if we have fallen, to get up and try again. Hope is a gift that our faith can give to us that will indeed meet the need of our hungry hearts. Hope is the essence of the Christian faith. The good news is that hope is there for us. Mike, tell us about the video clip you've got for us. I'm sure most of you have heard the uh, song, Oh Happy Day. It was uh, written by the, uh, or first performed by the the Edward Dawkins Singers, or Edward Hawkins Singers, back in 1960-whatever. Uh, that version showed up on the movie Secretariat. It was also performed with a new arrangement on uh, Sister Act 2 with Whoopi Goldberg. And I ran across this one, which was an arrangement I had never seen, but I really think y'all are going to like it a lot. It's uh, six very attractive young women, fresh out of college. They formed a singing group, and they will be performing for you, Oh Happy Day. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. La 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 la
la la la He taught me how He taught me how To walk To walk Find and pray To fight and pray Find and pray And He taught me how to live He taught me how to live Yes, He did Yes, He did Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day.